Now, from Atlanta, Georgia, it's the Carter Center's CEO, Paige Alexander. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Carter Center Weekend. We're so glad you're here. Tonight, we're going to talk about empowering women at every level of society. We're going to meet a few particularly powerful and inspiring women. We're going to pay tribute to a pair of special men who we lost recently. Plus, we'll have our traditional town hall where Jason and I and two of our experts will answer your questions. And we'll finish things up by auctioning off a couple of fantastic items and revealing the photo mosaic you all are becoming a part of with your contributions to our virtual photo booth. Remember to keep an eye on the auction, which ends in less than three hours now at cartercenter.org forward slash auction. And you can always text to CCW 2021 to 243725 to contribute to all the work we're doing together here at the Carter Center. From time to time throughout today's program, we're going to see glimpses of some of our awesome people doing the work you support around the world. And right now, I want to show you a video our board trustee chairman, Jason Carter, shared with the World Health Organization as it honored his grandmother, Rosalind Carter, for her 50 years of mental health advocacy. Dr. Tedros, members and participants in the 74th World Health Assembly, my name is Jason Carter. I'm the chair of the Carter Center's Board of Trustees and I'm honored to accept the award on behalf of my grandmother, Rosalind Carter. The World Health Organization's Director General's Award for Global Health is a great honor celebrating my grandmother's 50 years of advocacy. We appreciate enormously this recognition of her contribution to advancing global health. I'll note, that in when she spoke to the Medical Society of the World Health Organization in May of 1979, she became the first sitting First Lady of the United States to address the members of the WHO. It was a groundbreaking event as a First Lady, and it was also a groundbreaking for mental health, because on that day she stated uh, that health is a human right, and that you cannot have true health without recognizing mental health as a crucial component. Of course, since that time, over the last 40 years, the partnership between my grandparents, the Carter Center, and the World Health Organization has been remarkable. From guinea worm eradication program, other neglected tropical diseases, and of course, mental health work in places like Liberia that have provided a roadmap for other countries. So thank you for honoring her 50 years of advocacy, and I would love to read a letter from her. Dear Dr. Tedros, Jimmy joins me in sending greetings to you and everyone present for the 74th World Health Assembly. Thank you very much for taking time today to call attention to the importance of mental health by recognizing my efforts over the last 50 years to advocate for the millions of people worldwide living with behavioral health conditions. The Director General's Award for Global Health is especially meaningful to me in light of the Carter Center's long partnership with WHO to eradicate debilitating neglected tropical diseases and to promote the inclusion of mental health as an integral part of overall well-being. The role of the World Health Organization is more essential now than ever, and I applaud all that you have done to encourage a comprehensive response to COVID-19. Almost every nation has suffered the death and deprivation caused by this disease. The mental health and substance abuse consequences have been profound and widespread, and the need for effective treatments and services has never been more urgent. In my country, there has been great concern about the mental health of school children, isolated elderly parents, first responders, business owners, people who are out of work, and those recovering from illness. Practically everyone has been touched. My hope is that this is the moment when all nations will make behavioral health a priority and create quality systems of care that are equitably delivered. 
I've been waiting a long time to see this happen. I urge all of you attending to use your influence and talent to ensure that it does. While I regret that I cannot accept in person, I'm deeply grateful for this moving gesture of support and for your outstanding work to make a positive difference in the world. With best wishes, sincerely, Rosalind Carter. And I can assure you that those are heartfelt words. On behalf of my grandmother and our entire family, thank you to the World Health Organization for all that you've done, and particularly for honoring my grandmother's 50 years of service. Thank you. Alice is a Kara Center representative in Niger. After having participated in the interruption of Guinea worm transmission in Niger, the Kara Center is now involved 100% in the elimination of trachoma as a public health burden. As such, all the safe strategy is implemented in six out of eight regions, mainly the TT surgery in three regions, Zender, Maradi, and Disa. The past year has been a difficult one for all of us, one that has brought far too much loss. The Carter Center community has lost several dear friends, members of our chosen family. Among those was a personal friend to President and Mrs. Carter and a hero to so many Americans, the home run king, Henry Aaron, who passed away in January. We wanted to share this short tribute to Hank with all of you. Hi, my name is Angela Scott and I first met Mr. Aaron at the Carter Center weekend uh, when I used to bring a group of young people um, out to the event uh, in Colorado. He was so caring, so warm to the young people. And uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me um, with Mr. Aaron was he would always tell the young people, it doesn't matter where you come from, who your parents are, what neighborhood you're out of, none of that matter. You have potential to be everything and anything that you want to be. Um, and that resounded so much with those young people and me as well. And it made a difference. It changed their perspective on who they were and what they could become. Uh, and it made such an impact in their lives that many of them still are hearing that. That's echoing in their minds, even as they go throughout their lives. Mr. Aaron said, I can do and be anything that I want to be. You know, we see him as a baseball player. We saw him on the field, you know, and, and, and many people just know him in that way. They don't realize how much he was and how much he helped young people off the field. We appreciate his memory and that memory will never fade. Howdy folks, Matt Robbins here, and be sure to join us for our live auction. We're going to be selling one of President Carter's original paintings, so stick around. We'll be doing that right after the town hall meeting. This past year has been a great one for films about President Carter. First came Jimmy Carter, Rock and Roll President, directed by Mary Wharton. Her film is really rich with interviews and performances by a constellation of stars, including the Allman Brothers, Willie Nelson, Bob Dylan, Trisha Yearwood, and many more. It's amazing. And then another great documentary debuted last month at the Atlanta Film Festival. This one's called Carterland, directed by Georgia-born brothers Will and Jim Pattis. Carterland highlights President Carter's remarkable vision and accomplishments during his time in the White House. I'll let Mary Wharton and the Pattis brothers and our moderator, Emmy Award winning veteran journalist Kane Fauerbach, tell you all about it. But first, let's hear from a special friend of the Carter Center. Hey, everybody. Stephen Colbert here. Just wanted to give a virtual hello to your virtual meeting and to thank President Carter and former First Lady Rosalind Carter and all the wonderful contributors and supporters to the Carter Center for the work you've done over the last 40 years and over the last 15 months, whether it's continuing to eradicate guinea worm, or to work hard to make sure that there are free and fair elections around the globe, and this year, especially in Georgia. Please don't stop doing that, ever. Hi, I'm Kane Fairbaugh, and it's exciting for me to be able to have this opportunity 
to bring to you some interesting conversations with some groundbreaking filmmakers who have been at the forefront in trying to tell the previously unknown stories of President Jimmy Carter, his life, his administration, and his work around the globe. With me here today, we have Mary Warden, who is the director of Jimmy Carter, Rock and Roll President, and we have Jim and Will Pattis, who are the directors and producers of Carterland. Mary, I'm gonna start with you, and I really wanna sort of just dive into how did you come about with this idea that you were going to tackle this, what seems like a massive uh, project to be able to show and encompass all of the music that helped influence and launch Jimmy Carter's career? Well, it's interesting because when we first heard about this aspect of, of, of President Carter's life, um, I only heard a tiny kind of germ of it. This was a, an interesting opportunity to sort of get people to look at him in a different light. And hopefully, you know, we weren't trying to set the record straight or, you know, beat anyone over the head with, um, you're wrong about President Carter, but we just hoped that it might make people reconsider their notions of him and, and what he was able to accomplish as president. Well, Will and Jim, I want to turn to you right now because Mary just touched on something which is basically the very beginning of your documentary. Walter Mondale has a quote in which, you know, the story about Jimmy Carter goes something like this. And um, it is about him being effectively a misunderstood or a, perhaps a misrepresented uh, commander in chief. Um, so maybe tell me about how that influenced your approach to Carterland. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our premise is kind of tackling just his, pre whereas Mary's film is wonderful. It kind of captures what I would say is chapter one, where you kind of see how he becomes president through all these rock and roll figures. What our film does is we really try to tackle those specific four years that he was president and say, you know, look, he accomplished a lot more than a lot of people give him credit for. There's so much more to this, this man as president than, than people know. And so we started to explore this idea of a feature film um, on, on President Carter, specifically on his presidency. Uh, and at first we were you know, looking at it from a conservation angle, and then we realized there was just so much more to be told here. And uh, as Will said, you, know, you, know, you have a lot of young people in this country who are looking for answers out there and to, to see that there was a, we had a president in the, in the 1970s that uh, that had the answers, you know, that was putting solar panels on the roof of the White House, um, and that was addressing, you know, a lot of the problems that were were only just, you know, beginning to confront now. Um, he was trying to address these problems in the 1970s. We really saw how America had an opportunity in that moment, and and we lost it. And I think that. You know, a lot of that comes from the fact that um, Jimmy Carter was a truth teller and he told America the truth even when they weren't ready to hear it. You know, it was a very close election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter in 1976. Did these musical celebrities influence the outcome of that election? I think it did. I think that, you know, from what I understand, a big part of what helped Carter win was that he was able to mobilize a lot of young people to vote for him. And the young people were definitely influenced by the fact that he was quoting Bob Dylan lyrics um, at the convention, in his convention speech and in his stump speeches. And I think they were, you know, motivated by the fact that, you know, their heroes like the Allman Brothers and like, you know, Jimmy Buffett or, or who, whomever else were, were supporting him publicly. It was a signal to young people at that time who were very disillusioned by what had happened with Watergate. They were, you know, not happy about the Vietnam War. They were not happy with the Nixon administration and they were looking for change and they were looking for the truth. And that's something that Jimmy Carter represented yeah, and and Mary and Kane, if I might, it's interesting because the the he you know Carter was connecting with young people back when he was running for president. Pretty interesting. We're talking back in the 1970s, and now it's what's fascinating to me. And in this film, I mean, Jason Carter's grandson is in our film, and he kind of talks about 
he has this line where he says uh, President Carter was basically the first millennial president. And so I think it's a fascinating thing. He was relevant with young people back then. And I think hopefully if people watch your film, if they watch our film, they'll kind of see that, man, he really is kind of a millennial guy. He stands for a lot of things we care about still. The documentaries are ostensibly about President Jimmy Carter, but they are as much about Rosalind Carter as they are about Jimmy Carter. Rosalind Carter, um, as Jason Carter says in our film, is the best politician in the family. Um, and she advises President Carter on all these things. And it, in fact, she told President Carter that the Panama Canal really should wait to the second term um, because it was gonna cost him uh, a lot of votes. Um, that was, was the right thing to do politically. Um, but obviously President Carter um, wasn't interested in what was the right thing to do politically. He was interested in what, what's the right thing for America right now. I want you to tell me what do President and Mrs. Carter personally mean to you after having gone through this journey of making this film? So to me, it's a, it's a story of tremendous courage and one that should be idealized as Georgians and also Americans. There's a depth to President and Mrs. Carter that, that I think people really need to see. You know, seeing these people who um, honesty and morality are, are central to who they are, and they never compromised on their beliefs um, throughout their entire political lives. And that's something that um, is extremely difficult to do. The film is, is really kind of a love letter to the power of music. Music is the language of the heart. And, and I think that that was one thing that I, I learned about President Carter in this project was how very open his heart is. Jim and Will Pattis are the directors and producers of Carter Land. Mary Wharton is the director of Jimmy Carter Rock and Roll President. It has been my deepest pleasure being able to discuss all things Carter uh, with you guys today. And uh, I hope that it, everybody else who's been able to see this takes away something uh, that didn't know previously and maybe will hopefully be able to uh, catch when they watch these films. Thanks, you guys, for participating. Thanks, yep. Kane. Thanks, Kane. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, I am Mauricio Sauerbrick, Director of Carter Center Uncle Sikaisa's Elimination Program in the Americas based in Guatemala. We work to eliminate river blindness in six endemic countries in the Americas. And thanks to your trust and support, today disease elimination has been achieved and verified by WHO in four of the six countries. Thank you for your partnership, for which we are deeply grateful. Hello. My name is Barbara Smith, and I am the Vice President of Peace Programs here at the Carter Center. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ben Spears. Ben Spears began with the Carter Center almost a decade ago in 2013 as a graduate research assistant. He left to direct a peer-to-peer -peer sports program in the Middle East and then returned to the center in 2016. With the Democracy Program, Ben coordinated election observation and transition monitoring in the Middle East and North Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, with the Conflict Resolution Program, Ben focuses on the center's peace portfolio in Sudan, which includes both youth citizen observer and peace health programming. Prior to 2013, Ben managed field operations for multiple political campaigns and coordinated outreach for the late Congressman John Lewis. Ben started his international affairs path by following his older sister into North Atlanta High School's International Baccalaureate Program. He then went on to study liberal arts at al Ahwain University in Morocco, then studied international development at George Washington University and international nonprofit management at Georgia State University's Andrew Young School of Policy Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Spears. Thank you, Barbara. Having been born and raised here in Atlanta, it is an honor for me, an aspiring diplomat from Georgia, to carry on the work and the legacy of waging peace and fighting disease by another Georgia diplomat, President Carter. 
Tonight, I would like to tell you about some of the work that Carter Center is doing right now at the intersection of peace and health in Sudan. Sudan is in the northeast quadrant of Africa. It's a region plagued with violent conflict. In fact, currently, all seven of Sudan's neighbors are at war, either domestically or with each other. Sudan itself is undergoing a massive political change from dictatorship to democratic rule, prompted by nonviolent protests led by youth and women, and hopefully leading to 2024 elections. But the context for peace building and disease eradication in Sudan is difficult to say the least. Let's narrow in further on where we're working exactly. You may have heard of the Darfur region, a sprawling territory in Sudan's west, where a civil war began in the early 2000s. It's there in Darfur's southernmost tip that the community of Radom is the epicenter of a river blindness epidemic, as well as a political conflict that threatens to upend a fragile but important stability there. This disease is a painful parasitic infection that leads to blindness. The parasite is transmitted by the bite of black flies that often live along rivers, thus the name. While there's no vaccine to prevent river blindness, several treatments are available, and yet reaching remote regions of Sudan with the treatments is not only dangerous, but exceedingly difficult. After decades of misrule, Sudan's infrastructure is terribly weakened. You can see it in the many hours a day that Sudanese live without electricity, the fact that they lack plumbed water, and that the only reliable transport method into and out of Radom is via helicopter. As a further example of just how broken the infrastructure in Sudan really is, let me tell you about my most recent visit there. The Peace Health Team began our multi-day journey at the Khartoum Airport's small domestic terminal. This open-air terminal is responsible for ticketing and boarding just a few flights. One's commercial, maybe one is operated by the UN. And in the early hours of dawn, under fluorescent lighting, a crowd is gathering at the ticket counter. And as soon as the ticket agent shows herself bravely in the terminal, this whole crowd flying on her airline and her airplane swarms her. After 30 minutes, it seems no progress has been made. Not a single bag was checked. Not a single ticket was handed out. And the swarm of people is unmoved. And I stood back a short distance, turned to a colleague I'm traveling to Radom with, and I say, this system is really and truly broken, like a lot of others in Sudan. And my colleague somewhat tragically turns and says to me, no, this is working. The two of us continue to wait patiently, and eventually the crowd and I boarded the flight. Sudanese will tell you that that kind of system is working. But this example is indicative of the extent to which the whole country's infrastructure is highly dysfunctional. So let me tell you, Sudan has a long way to go during the years ahead to transition politically and develop economically. In my years of working in Sudan, I've learned that the Carter Center is one of the few organizations that has stayed the course. Even in very remote villages like Radom, the work of President and Mrs. Carter is very well known. In 1995, President Carter negotiated what's called the Guinea Worm ceasefire, which led to the longest cessation of open hostilities for humanitarian purposes globally, and it enabled Sudan to enter then previously inaccessible areas for public health action. And in the decades since, the Carters and the Carter Center have stayed to wage peace and fight disease alongside Sudan and the Sudanese people. Honestly, President Carter is better known in Sudan for his efforts to eradicate the guinea worm than he is for being president of the United States. With massive support from the Carter Center, Sudan has eliminated river blindness in several places, like Abu Hamad and Gadaraf, other regions of Sudan. Then, in 2017, Sudan's Federal Ministry of Health approached the Carter Center seeking help in mitigating violence, enabling an environment for more effective health work in their next target. But the places where river blindness and neglected tropical diseases still exist are harder and harder to reach. They're ever more remote and more dangerous, and therefore more difficult and expensive to treat. The community of Radom is one such community. It's Sudan's next target for river blindness elimination, but before there can be health, there must be peace. 
There are many factors of conflict right now in Sudan. The current situation in South Darfur is not defined as outright war. And still, fighting in the neighboring areas have displaced hundreds of thousands of people into South Darfur, which intensifies tensions over the precious land and water that exists. Instability and this region's isolation are immense barriers to promoting public health. Myself and my colleagues from the Carter Center have worked tirelessly to create the Radom Peace Health Council. The Carter Center has been training over several years this 50-person body, composed of all of Radom's demographic groups, like farmers and herders, refugees, displaced people, faith leaders, young people and women, and we're training them on critical skills like dialogue, mediation, advocacy. These workshops also provide a unique forum for discussions and for developing important cohesion so that the community can address their own complex and hyper-localized conflicts. And our efforts are working. The trainings have gone so well, in fact, that the reduction in conflicts has allowed Radom to begin focusing more on their health needs. Recently, five representatives of the Radom Peace Health Council visited Sudan's capital, Khartoum, to advocate the Federal Ministry of Health to accelerate their river blindness programming. When you have peace, you can have health. Our peace and health efforts in the Radom are ongoing. We're continuing the vision that President Carter brought to the Guinea Worm ceasefire more than 25 years ago. And by helping the Sudanese to build their own peace and access the appropriate resources, they can fix what has seemed so helplessly broken and to continue their difficult but hopeful path towards democracy. And as that happens, they may be able to eliminate diseases like river blindness. Carter Center staff and partners are taking immense risks in the global pandemic. In fact, on my most recent trip to Sudan, I contracted COVID and came back. Fortunately, I was able to recover at my own home. But I share this because we are on the front lines of both disease eradication and peace building and accomplishing a lot in a very difficult time. Tonight, we are all mindful of the immense goals and huge expectations that President Carter set for the Carter Center. Efforts to eliminate neglected tropical diseases are going to continue to take us to the world's most difficult and remote places. The cost per disease case is ever increasing, but we're hoping that local proactive peace building and stronger institutions create a more secure environment for public health campaigns that people need. These efforts not only come with physical difficulties, but financial challenges as well. We're hoping to take advantage of the Carter Center's assets in peace and in health to implement innovative projects that remove or diminish conflict as a barrier to disease elimination. Currently, the Sudanese people are improving their own lives and building their own peace. The Carter Center is there providing critical skills, knowledge, and resources to see that through. The internal funding that our peace and health work in Sudan receives from your generous donations to the Carter Center is essential to carrying on President Carter's legacy. For all that you do to support and bolster the Carter Center, thank you. I am Dr. Miri, the country representative of the Carter Center in Nigeria, and I also direct the health programs. With your kind support, we have been able to eliminate guinea worm disease in the country in 2013. Also, two out of the nine states where the Carter Center is supporting, we have been able to eliminate three of the neglected tropical diseases in these two states. Hi, welcome back. Now we are at the part of the town hall for Carter Center weekend, which Jason and I really enjoy. So we're going to take some questions for the field and, uh, and we look forward to having this conversation and answering your questions. But before we start, Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about your grandparents? Sure, I will. And it's uh, 8.30 in Atlanta and um, this is live. And my grandparents just sent me a text message uh, by a friend to say that they're in plane watching. So just like you all 
Um, they're experiencing this tonight. They're doing great. They are um, planning, as you may know, uh, their 75th anniversary party, which will be next weekend. And so all of us in the family are thrilled uh, to be going down there, of course, after COVID. None of us have seen them enough. Um, but we're excited to go down there next week and, and have a great celebration of that incredible, I would say, achievement. But it's really a blessing. I mean, their partnership, as you know, uh, is an incredible one. And we celebrate it tonight and every time we do a Carter Center event. But, um, you know, you and I, Paige, we get to talk to them a lot. And, you know, one of the things, of course, that they've been excited about, is, as you all saw earlier, the WHO uh, award or recognition for my mother's 50 years of advocacy for mental health issues. That has been a remarkable thing to celebrate this year. The ongoing work of the mental health program is really incredible, and my grandparents are very excited about that. Um, but the other thing, as you know, um, that they ask us every time we talk in our sort of monthly founders discussions uh, is about guinea worm. And you know, we've heard a little bit about it tonight, but news, so why don't you share uh, what's going on with guinea worm right now? Sure. Well, I, I will tell you that I've been in international development and I don't often see the successes we have, but it's because of our long-term efforts and things like guinea worm, which in 2019, from 2019 to 2020, we went down to uh, 27 cases, but this year so far, we only have four human cases. That's amazing. And that is truly amazing. And especially during a time of COVID, when you worry about whether you can get out to the field and see people, this is really what the Carter Center does so well. We've got community workers who were in the community in place and using the bubble of their community to work on the behavior changes that come along with trying to rid their societies of guinea worms. So four humans with guinea worm this year right. so far. That seems very close with excellent surveillance, of course. What's the situation with dogs? And then what else is going on in the health program? Yeah, so we, we are watching and the surveillance is the key because that's the only way we can get to elimination and final eradication. And so with the dogs, we're down 73% uh, through a whole process of tethering dogs, treating ponds. It's really been amazing. But the health aspects, the health programs itself, we have been doing this in trachoma. We're doing this, uh, I'll give you an example in trachoma. That's the, the, uh, the neglected tropical disease where the eyelid turns inside and causes blindness and it is preventable and we go through as we were just hearing from the field the safe program we've done over 850,000 surgeries to prevent blindness we've given over 200 doses of medication 200 million 200 million yeah, thank you no problem. Don't, yeah that's a, that's a good catch uh, of medication we've worked with facial cleanliness we've been in 100,000 villages working on education and the environmental aspects, we've built over 3 million latrines. So that is in trachoma. River blindness is another great story because this year it was the first neglected tropical disease to start mass drug administration again in Uganda. So in the middle of COVID, we were able to get out and work on the mass drug administration. So we have already eliminated river blindness in four countries in the Americas and in two places in, throughout, throughout Uganda, Nigeria, and other places we've actually worked at the subnational level to interrupt transmission. So when you have those type of results, and it's, it's proof of concept that we're almost there, with lymphatic filariasis, which a lot of people know as elephantiasis. So that is successful in the Dominican Republic, stopping the mass drug because this way, we know it's actually not there anymore. And we're very in two, uh, we've eliminated it in two, uh, two states in Nigeria. So again, this is a place that you really have proof of concept right. and we're just very close, so it's and exciting. We've, we've, we have worked ourselves out of a job, which yeah. is good, right? right? In many of those areas. And of course, what that means is we have a responsibility and obligation to go finish it elsewhere uh, in all these other contexts. But um, let me ask about peace and the democratic elections. I, I, um, I don't think that we have eradicated uh, threats to democracy, um, unfortunately. So what, what have we been doing? I know this year one of the things that we talked about and that you participated pretty heavily in was some work on the U.S. elections for the first time in our history. Um, so will you tell us a little bit about that and then uh, we can talk about the other peace programs? Okay, sounds good. So yes, when I came in last June, it was uh, we were in the middle of a bit of a crisis in the U.S. and to do what we do over with international election observation and to try to do that uh, 
with any ability to say we're looking at this at home was yeah. difficult unless we actually did look at it at home. So yeah, our and credibility it would it required us to do something at home. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So in a conversation with you and your grandparents, we really debated whether or not we wanted to get involved domestically. And I think it was really important that we did. I was able to do the audit in three separate counties in Georgia. I could have been anywhere in the world. Right. And at the same time, we were still doing the international election observation for Bolivia, for Cote d'Ivoire, for Myanmar. These were important areas that we can show the transition between what's happening internationally and what's happening here in the US. And you know, as Ben Spears was just talking about, you were working at the Peace Health Nexus because right. in a lot of places, you can't have health programs unless you have peace. And so right. we're out there in Sudan. We're working with the International Observer in Mali. We are, as the Carter Center, one of the only, or we are the only nonprofit uh, that is allowed as part of the international observation. And in Israel and Palestine, you know, we were hoping for elections this year, which are not happening right now, but we are working on conflict resolution. And so again, the conflict resolution in the Middle East is also doing here in the US. And we're looking at the political violence, we're working with faith leaders, and we're trying to talk about how, how this looks globally and taking a real look at it ourselves. So. That, that's great. I'm so excited about the um, international observer aspects in Mali yeah. and, and Sudan and, and then of course what we um, around the world with respect to conflict resolution. It's, it's, it's awesome. Tell us about, lastly, before we get to the question, uh, Inform uh, Women, Inform Transform, Women Transform, Lives. Transform Lives. Yes, so this yes. is a very exciting program that was launched by our rule of law folks this, this year. And in the middle of the pandemic, we recognized that our access to information, especially for women, was really difficult during mm -hmm. COVID. And so we've launched the Inform Women, Transform Lives campaign to help women globally realize their potential and their access to information and what that can bring to their families. And so actually we have a video we'd love to show. Thanks. When you're in the dark, life can be hard to navigate and solutions may feel out of reach. For women in our city and around the world, it can be even more challenging to access the services we need. And without a clear way forward, we hit a dead end. Fortunately, we have a right to information, and information is power. Power to transform our lives, our families, and our communities. Informed women can secure municipal services like clean water, improved infrastructure, and electricity services that meet our basic needs. Informed women can draw on social protections like job training, disability allowances and food subsidies, enabling us to improve our lives. And informed women can have meaningful voices by participating in public meetings, being a part of decision making and engaging local officials, all of which strengthen our communities. Informed women can access the kinds of benefits that benefit us all. And with the support of our city government, neighbors and family members, we can build communities that are more secure, peaceful and prosperous. Inform women, transform lives. And you too can be part of the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign. And we'd love it if you went to Carter Center backslash uh, inform, take the pledge. Info pledge. Info pledge, thank you, <laughs> info right. pledge. Uh, to sign the pledge and be an ally for this. So thank you. This has been, a, that's sort of the roundabout of our peace programs right now. Well, that's great. And I know we have some questions and the only reason I knew the name of it is because there's a monitor in front of us uh, that also has a couple of questions that we're gonna right. answer. Um, and from the guests that have come in at different times. So this first one um, is a question about how we're handling the situation in Myanmar, uh, where the military seized control of the government after a free and fair election that we observed back in 2020. Um, I'll talk about that for a second great. and you Perfect. can correct me when I get it wrong. Um, when we observed the election in 2015 in Myanmar, and I co-led that uh, election observation mission with Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and a remarkable human rights champion. Um, we believed that that election was a very important 
step on Myanmar's transition to democracy, it was not perfect. Uh, the military even then maintained control of a significant portion of the parliament and significant ministries in Myanmar, including the Homeland Security, essentially ministry and the Department of Defense. And so while it was a step forward, we all knew it was imperfect. In addition, the Carter Center um, was highly critical of the treatment of the Rohingya and the continuing human rights violations that are ongoing in that aspect of, of, of Myanmar. Um, since that time, uh, of course, there was an additional election during COVID, the Carter Center wasn't able to send an international team there because of the pandemic, but we were able to organize a, a huge number of domestic of Myanmar Burmese observers who were able to observe the election and provide a, a really important uh, international check and, and domestic check on that election. Of course, since then, the military has seized power uh, entirely, but you can see from the last several months in Myanmar that that transition to democracy uh, is real in many ways. I don't believe that the people of Myanmar are going to tolerate uh, the military. The military knows that, I believe. And so I think that we are still having to monitor it very closely, having to deal with the ongoing human rights violations. Um, but also I'm somewhat optimistic that, that once that door to democracy was opened as it was in Myanmar in 2000, uh, 2015, I think we'll, we'll see some, some uh, additional growth there. But uh, right now what the Carter Center is doing is continuing to monitor um, social media and others for digital threats to democracy as part of that program um, and some other things. But I, I think we'll, we'll, we're going to keep an eye on it. It's a place where we have an important history and uh, I think an important role to play in the future. Yeah, no, very true. Uh, so the next question is, a viewer wants to know the details of how we've achieved such great progress in getting worm disease in the past year and a half. So for that answer, I'm going to suggest that we actually go to Dr. Kashyap Ijaz, who is our new Vice President for Health. You can see all of the information about Kashyap on our experts page, but uh, he comes to us from the CDC. We were really lucky to get him this year. He has worked on HIV, tuberculosis, uh, and Ebola. So he actually knows these diseases right. inside and out. So I'm going to let him answer the guinea worm question. Thank you very much for the question. The progress that has been made towards eradication of guinea worm is truly remarkable. We basically began with 3.5 million cases back in the 80s. And now we are down, as of last year, to just 27 cases. The progress that has been made without the use of either a medicine or a vaccine is unprecedented. When we look at smallpox, it has taught us that eradication is extremely difficult. And the final few cases are especially elusive. The polio eradication campaign, which employs a vaccine, is facing the same issue. Now, in the case of guinea worm, we don't have a medicine or a vaccine. And in spite of that, we have made great progress. We've also left no stone unturned, and we are leaving no stone unturned. Despite the technical challenges in the past few years with, with the guinea worm spill into to where, in the animals, the program has adapted new interventions, which includes proactive tethering of dogs, alongside more aggressive surveillance and the expanded protection of water sources has been utilized. In addition, an exhaustive research agenda is helping to better understand transmission dynamics and better target interventions. The commitment of the national ministry, ministries of health is very, very important. I would say it's critical to the current progress as well as the, our program relies on these strong relationships. In addition to that, the most important relationships that we have built are with the communities themselves because our community engagement and our trust with them is what keeps the community involved and they are the ones who are eradicating guinea worm within their own communities. Due to the effort of the communities as well as the ministries of health and the frontline workers, we have already had a 79% decline in the number of guinea worm human cases this year compared to the same time last year. We're down to four cases from 19 cases last year around the same time. Additionally, we have also had a 69% reduction in animal infections. I am very confident that if we continue to focus and work with the communities as well as the ministries of health with support of partners and donors like all of you, we can achieve eradication because of the resilient frontline workers and staff that work tirelessly to prevent needless suffering. They have shown it is possible, though they need the world's support 
or I would say continued support to finish this critical last stage. Thank you. Thanks, Kashef. Um, and of course, the, the new hires of Kashef and Barbara as the Peace and the Health Vice Presidents have been wonderful. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more from Barbara later, but um, it's really been a great thing to watch you build this team uh, and put it together. So both to celebrate the legacy and also to, to bring it forward. So it's wonderful. And of course, in this really crazy time for you, um, which has been COVID for everybody. And one of the next questions is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the Carter Center's financial support? Um, and I know, a little bit, but I'll toss it to you. I know that COVID has affected everything, um, but it hasn't really um, hurt anything too bad. Um, I know that there's some issues that we're confronting, and I'll say this, that uh, one of the things that, that is, is true about now is Ben Spears left finally uh, to go back to Sudan. He's right. there now. Um, Adam Weiss, who's the director of our Guinea Worm program, we had a Zoom the other day and he uh, was Zooming from Chad and he was so excited to be in Chad. So we have started from an Atlanta standpoint to get back out after COVID, but what, what has been the big impact of, of COVID on the finances of the center? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, because your grandparents have saved for a rainy day, we're in a right. better position than I think many of our, our counterparts are. Uh, at the same time, developing countries are struggling, but developed countries are struggling too. Right. So the UK, between Brexit and between COVID, has pulled back on their foreign assistance. And they were such a major partner for so long for us uh, over the years for these neglected tropical diseases. So losing their assistance has been tough and that just came in last month. And so, you know, fortunately, again, saving to, for the rainy day, but when you have stories about being so close on guinea worm to eradicating this, and as your grandfather, you know, we've promised that he will see the last worm. <laughs> We're so close on all of these things that it's really important that we are able to rely on our donors and to rely on uh, on other partners and private partners to come in and help us with this. And the other piece of that, the financial stewardship of, again, the founders and the folks at the Carter Center before that has built up the, the really great financial strength also could help us help some of our partners, uh, right. perhaps, who've also suffered as a result of the, the British government's essentially uh, elimination of their right. neglected like, tropical disease budget. So that's something that we're confronting. But yeah. um, why don't you go to the next question? OK, so the next question, uh, audience member would like to know about our activities concerning Syria and the 10 year civil war there. So for that answer, I'm going to toss it to Barbara Smith as we were talking about mm -hmm. our new vice president for peace. Barbara comes to us from Mountain Time Development, a consulting firm she started after working at the at USAID, at the NSC, she worked at the Asia Foundation, she's had a lot of experience, and so she's seen a lot of this firsthand. So let me have Barbara take that one. Sadly, the Syrian civil war is now 10 years old. And, and yes, we are still working to try to help build sustainable peace in Syria. We're doing this in two ways. One is through research and dialogue that brings people together to try and change the international community's approach in Syria, because we believe what it has been doing isn't working. We are also continuing our innovative conflict mapping project, which uses social media and other digital sources to track where conflict is happening, including in an interesting new way. We are re-crunching our numbers to help demining organizations determine which parts of the country most likely have large amounts of landmines and unexploded weapons so that they can prioritize those areas for clearing, making them safer for citizens who live in those areas now and for refugees who want to return home. Thanks, Barbara. It's really good to hear sort of where our work is going in this area. So I think we're about out of time for this, but I just want to say again, you know, everything we do here is possible because of the generosity of our donors and the success of our experts who you're hearing from tonight on the ground and our field staff. So thank you for all that you've been doing. It, it, it makes a difference. It makes these programs run. Yeah, and thank you, Paige, for all that you've done in this last year. And one of the great things about this event this year um, has been these messages from the field. Yeah. It's so important to me that we recognize just the giant team of Carter Center folks we have, not just in Atlanta, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And I've, I've appreciated that uh, aspect of tonight. Um, hopefully next year we'll all be together. Um, and as we um, move out of the town hall, uh, I want to acknowledge and take a moment 
uh, to acknowledge one of the great participants in this weekend, but also one of the most important partners in my family's uh, political career and all of our endeavors, and that's Walter Mondale. Um, Vice President Mondale, of course, was a groundbreaking vice president who transformed that office from a figurehead into an office that has real consequential policy work, uh, real consequential international relations work, consequential relationships uh, with Congress and to sort of the powerhouse leader that it is today. Um, of course, he also has been a great friend to me, uh, to our family, to the Carter Center uh, for many, many years. And so as we lost him very recently, we just wanted to take this minute uh, with a brief tribute to celebrate the life of Walter Mondale. told the truth, we obeyed the law, and we kept the peace. Uh, how many administrations can say that? Thank you. Seeing those images uh, of Vice President Mondale from the Carter weekend uh, a couple of years ago really just brings back what a, what a great person and what a warm and exciting presence he was. So we're thrilled. Um, to have this evening another uh, incredible leader um, to join us. Um, and as if the great diplomats of the 20th century were uh, ever listed, Madeleine Albright would certainly be on the list. She was, of course, the first uh, woman to ever serve as Secretary of State of the United States. She was also the United Nations uh, Ambassador, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Um, and before that, what you may not know is that she served uh, in the Carter White House in the National Security Council. And she has been a great friend to me, to the Carter Center, um, and to my grandparents for many, many years. Uh, she also is a good friend of Paige, um, who has uh, got a great conversation with her uh, and will be excited um, to have uh, get a chance to take a look at it. So Paige, we're ready to throw it back to you and your conversation that you had uh, with Madeline Albright uh, just the other day. Secretary Albright, it is wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us for the Carter Center weekends. This is what democracy looks like. That's the theme. So I have the benefit of having worked with you starting in 1990 when I was headed off to Czechoslovakia and you kindly made an introduction for me to Michael Jantowski and, and Havel and that was a wonderful way to start and then our overlaps in Kosovo were equally as wonderful. So thank you for all of your support over time and I love your pen. I was trying to decipher exactly what that was. Well, I was very glad to have a peanut pin uh, in order to celebrate President Carter. And I'm so pleased that you are now at the Carter Center and that all the various things you've done have added up in a way where uh, you are the perfect person to really be there at what is a remarkable, remarkable, um, every part of the Carter Center in terms of its memories, the things it does, its outreach and the things that President Carter continues to do abroad. Well, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I think it's been, to say it's been an unprecedented year is really an understatement. I think, yeah, I voted twice here in Georgia and, you know, elections that were truly consequential in ways that I don't think a very red state would have expected. So it has been an opportunity for us to really see democracy at work. And you were, saw the rock and roll presidency and participated in the making of that uh, movie. And so thank you for all of your comments. But what I loved is you picked up the phone and you wanted to talk to President Carter after that. So tell us a little bit about how that ended up occurring. 
Well, I have to say, I loved the movie and I was very surprised by all the things because I didn't come into the administration until the second year. Uh, and I hadn't really known President Carter very well before. And so I loved the movie and I obviously loved working for him. But I decided that uh, I, it would be terrific to have a call with him personally. We've done that off and on at various times. And so I requested a call and believe it or not, it was on January 6th. And we were on the phone together, both of us, I think, having been alerted to something going on um, up in, on Capitol Hill. And we're watching this unbelievable scene. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I, I was speechless and, and absolutely appalled. And I thought I must be watching some terrible movie because um, I had been to Capitol Hill an awful lot and obviously been in the chamber many times. And what flashed through my mind because I was on the phone and because I love to think about my time with President Carter, but what flashed through my mind was listening to him give the State of the Union message from the podium with Walter Mondale sitting in the spot where the vice president sits. And it really reminded me of what two remarkable leaders uh, could do, how they worked with Congress, uh, despite uh, all the aspects of executive legislative relations and, and how President Carter in choosing Vice Pre Mondale to be vice president helped to create the modern vice presidency. Uh, absolutely. I think that was a period in time that we all look back at uh, as a normalization in how our democracy worked. And so I can imagine on January 6th, you must have been questioning whether or not we were headed down a path. You've written books on this and talking about our concern about populism. But did you think we we're going to be headed in the right direction after this last election? Or did you foresee this as being, uh, you know, just a, a swing of the pendulum? Well, I have to say, and you spoke about having gone to Czechoslovakia, and um, I came to the United States with my family in November 1948. Uh, my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, and he did not want to work for the communists after the coup in February 1948. And I'll never forget his coming here and saying to us, Americans don't understand how fragile democracy is and how resilient it is. And I will never forget that because um, it is certainly true in terms of the kinds where things we're seeing. I have to tell you, I'm not, I don't think it is just a swing of the pendulum. I think that um, it is a, a new period. It's not gonna go back to where it was. Um, and uh, I think there's no way to kind of think about normalization in this. It is a new period and a challenge to democracy for a number of reasons, but the key one, I think, is that there are new weapons uh, to undermine what is the basic breath of democracy and the blood of democracy, which is information and knowing where information comes from and that it's true because you cannot have democracy if the people do not know what is happening. And added to that are a whole group of new weapons that are um, described as cyber, various right. cyber things that people don't understand, but it is, they are very dangerous. And so I think we can't just kind of think, okay, well, we'll sit around and it'll get back to some kind of normalization. We are in a new period. Right. Well, it is, uh, you know, you have lived your life with democracy being the focus, whether you were in exile and London or whether you were in exile again with the communists from Czechoslovakia, you have really lived your life living these, uh, these issues. I know that with the last book that you wrote, uh, Hell and Other Destinations, you talk about your post-Secretary of State life. And I think you and President Carter and Mrs. Carter absolutely share that in your intention to do something new and make every chapter interesting. So I'm curious for, you know, in that mirroring between you and President Carter on this next phase in life, you know, I think you're right. Cybersecurity is a place that we are all going to be suffering, learning as we get older what this new, you know, front line is. 
So what worries you the most? I assume it's the disinformation and the cybersecurity piece, but are there other elements of our own democracy that we want to move forward in a productive way? Well, I really do think that we have to analyze what is the basis of democracy. Um, right. And it's obviously participation by the people based on information that they have, but also leadership, which recognizes that um, democracy is not easy uh, and that it always is a journey uh, and that democracy has to deliver. Uh, and there's always this question as to whether democracy um, is uh, just uh, you know, talking about democratic ideals or also uh, the economy that people uh, need to be able to have a life. And then I've always said democracy has to deliver because people wanna vote and eat. And I have to say that President Carter has been the most inspirational person in all of this in his post-presidential life. It was wonderful to work for him when he was president and his real um, dedication to human rights. But the kinds of things that he's done since are also the element of what has to happen for democracy. People need to be healthy. He has certainly worked on that. And then people need to be able to practice their um, ideas about how to be involved in democracy. And he and Mrs. Carter have worked very hard in terms of doing that. And so I do think what we need are more Jimmy Carters, people <laughs> who understand how hard democracy is, are devoted to it, and are willing to put their shoulder to the wheel. So I am for more Jimmy Carters. Well, thank you for that. It really, for the next generation to see what you and President Carter have done really sets us on a path and the Carter Center exists because this is what a post-presidency should look like. So thank you for participating with us this weekend. It is wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to have your support. I know President and Mrs. Carter send their best and thank you for all of your efforts, both in the White House and outside of the White House to make this world a better, more democratic place. Well, thank you, Paige, and thank, I'm so grateful that you are there and please give my love and admiration to the Carters. Absolutely, thanks so much. Hello, bonjour, Jambo, Mbote. I'm Sylvette Balungo from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm working on the Human Rights Program. I help civil societies, organization partners, mainstream gender in the projects. Thank you so much, Carter Center donors and friends, for supporting the work we are doing. Aksanti, Matondo, thank you. My name is Eric Vonk. My name is Karen Vonk. And we are here in the Richland Distilling Company in Richland, Georgia, not very far from Plains. And uh, those of you who were with us uh, last night, we had a, a great time. Um, we were drinking uh, a presidential old fashioned and hope you uh, really enjoyed it. I was traveling to Amsterdam in the early 90s from the Atlanta airport and President Carter was on the plane. We must have talked for hours. After um, that meeting on the plane, uh, President Carter invited uh, Eric to be on the Carter Center Advisory Board. Anyone with any inclination or any courage to help anyone in the world should take an interest in the, in the Carter Center. However modest, however small, or much better, however big, um, should do that. What I'm holding here is one of approximately 180, less than 200 bottles of Richland rum, presidential rum, that the president actually has helped make and three years later has helped bottle. Two cases of 12 bottles and some individual bottles have been auctioned off and have fetched very high prices, but not enough, never enough. Every dime of the auction of these bottles benefits the Carter Center. And we hope that you or anyone you can mobilize will bid on six of the bottles that are available as of June 1 through June 26. Please help support the Carter Center 
and have become owner of something that is absolutely one of a kind. Let's, um, let's raise some good money for a great cause. Start bidding. During Carter Center weekend last year, we passed the hat to raise money to support our work. I mean, we literally passed this hat from Sue and Rob Engelke to me, and we put it up for auction. Well, here we are again, hat in hand, inviting you to go big again at this year's live auction. Our great auctioneer, Matt Robbins, has saddled up and made it all the way to Boston, and he's ready to take your bids right now. So let's go, bid high. Good luck, everybody. Never heard this crowd so Thank quiet. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> By the oh, way, you right. look marvelous. Even better than, dare I say, John Wayne. Of course, the world needs another Duke, don't we? Howdy and welcome to oh, all yes, our live do. virtual Zoom auction bidders. It's great to see your smiling faces. And as well, we'd like to welcome all of you that are participating <laughs> online in the online auction and program. Thank you for being here. We missed you all. And uh, this is the first step to getting back to normal, as Jason mentioned, in the town hall. Again, we can't thank you enough for joining us and supporting all the great things that the Carter Center does. Um, and I just want to remind you, just keep bidding online right up to the last minute. Keep those bids going in this live auction and keep making a difference in our world because you truly are. And that's the wonderful thing about this organization. Matt Robbins here along with my lovely and talented wife, Danae. Here she is. We'll be taking your bids tonight and uh, so just get our attention and uh, use your bid cards we'll get into that in a minute here but Danae's here so when you get tired of looking at me you can look at her terms are like any auction it's cash credit card pay the Carter Center and high bidder wins um, we've got to go with four different items tonight and what you want to do is just listen to me I'm probably going to mention your names if I tell you you're out or and or your bid number so that means you need to bid again, just like the big live auctions that we've done in the past. And uh, we'll try and go a little more slowly because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think, uh, I look at this screen and it reminds me a little bit of Hollywood Squares meeting the Brady Bunch. <laughs> but uh, we decided we're going to dub you all the Carter Bunch. So the Carter Bunch tonight's <laughs> going to set a record for a virtual live Zoom auction, because as far as we know, it's never been done before with both parties able to see and talk to each other. So quite the challenge technologically, but they've done it here, and here we are. So uh, rest assured, you're going to set a record tonight, uh, definitely for the Carter Center, if not the world right here. So before we begin, I want to start with our exercises to warm everybody up. So if you can have your bid cards ready and hold them up so we can see them. And now you can push them towards the screen or raise them in the air. You know, raise those bids and arms. Left hand, right hand. Yes, sir. That's it. The other hand. <laughs> Try nodding your head a few times in case you, you need to nod. Those upside down ones, yeah, that's fine too. There's only so many ways to read a number. All right. Now excited bids, let's see those nods, yeah, and your bid cards. We don't have many items tonight, but we've got the bidders to make it well worthwhile. And since you're all warmed up, I'm going to warm up too. So how about rubber baby buggy bumper, rubber baby buggy bumper, big black bug with the big black bear, made the big black bear bleed right bed blood on the bathroom rug, stripling stranger straight straight towards the struggling stream, round the rough and rugged rock, the ragged rascal ran, Tommy and Tadamus took two teas and tied them atop of two tall trees, plume a place of pewter platter on a pile of plates. Theopolis thistle, the famous thistle sifter, while sifting the civil of unsifted thistle, thrust 3,000 thistles through the thick of his thumb. And Betty bought her, bought some butter, but said to butter's bitter, if I put it in my batter, make my batter bitter, so she bought a bit of better butter, put it in her bitter, better, made her bitter, better, better, so does better, Betty bought her, bought a bit of better butter. Did y'all hear that all right? Everybody here, thumbs up. All right, well, let's rock and roll in the 2021 live virtual Zoom auction. And we're going to start right off the bat with item number 116 in your live auction catalog. That's the president and first lady's photograph donated by Mr. and Mrs. Dan Ostrander. And this one's got a playful tone to it because it's got President George H.W. Bush doing the bunny ears behind Barbara there. So quite a piece here. Thank you, Dan. And here we go. 
on auction item number 116 at 5,000 where? At 5,000, yep. thank you. Now 10 bid or 10, 10, 10, 42's in. At 5, need 10,000. Yep. At 10, now 15,000. At 15, you're out, Joanne. At 15, 15, yep. now 20,000, Rob. At 20,000, daughter, 20, 20, 20, 20, bid or 20,000. Joanne's in at 15, need 20. Yep. At 20, yep. thank you. Now 25, 25, 5, 5, bid or 25. At 25,000, you're out, Joanne. Thank you. Now 25 and 30. <laughs> at 30,000, daughter, 30, 30, 30, bid at 30,000. At 30, at 30, Robin Sewer out at 30, at 25, but I'm on 30, at 30, thank you. Now 35, your turn, Joanne, at 35, 35, 5, 5, bit at 35, at 35, 35, 35, 5, 35, 35, 5, 5, 35, all done at 35, and now 40,000, at 40, and 45, 45, 5, 5, at 45, 5, 5, 5, 45, and 50, at 50,000, 55, 55, 43's in, need 55,000. Rob, you're out, Joanne, you're out, at 50,000, thank you, now 50. 55 Hugo. At 55 Hugo, and you're out to Joanne. At 55, 55, 5, 50,000. Now 55, 55, 5. Yep. At 55 and 60. <coughs> at 60,000, daughter, daughter, 60. At 60,000, daughter, daughter, 60. At 60. Robin Hugo, you're out. At 60. At 60. Now 65, 65, ma'am. At 65, 65. Yeah, Joanne. At 65. At 65,000, 65,000. All done, 65,000. I sold out 60,000, Robin Sue. What's your number again, Rob? 25. 25. 25. Thank you. Thank you. See there, that's how easy it goes. Yeah, give everybody a hand. And uh, remember, you can always bid your neighbor up there, whether they're usually they're by, on a table beside you. On this, they're either above you or alongside of you or below you or somewhere on the screen. But uh, we appreciate all those bids. Remember, every bid counts. Item 117 is your guitar autographed by Dave Matthews. He also did a nice uh, art piece of artwork on the guitar because uh, he also paints. It's signed several places, and it's donated by our good friend, Mr. Peter Conlon, who's donated so many great guitars over the years to the Carter Center, and we thank Peter for that, as well as Dave Matthews. Item 117, the Dave Matthews autographed guitar in your catalog. At 25,000 where? At 25,000, I thank yep. you, now 30. At 25, 30, at 30, Hugo's in at 25, now 30,000. At 30,000, daughter, yep. 30, now 35, 5, 5, 35, Hugo, you were out at 35. At 35,000, at 21's in. 35, yep. now 40, sir, at 40,000. At 40,000, daughter, 40, 40, 40, 40 bid to 40,000. Hugo's in at 35, need 40. At 40,000, daughter, 40, 40, 40, 40 bid to 40,000. At 40,000, at 40,000, 40, all done 40. Yep. I thank you. 21's in, 40,000, now 45. At 45, Hugo, at 45, 45, 5, 5, or anybody else, at 45, 45, 5, 5, bit of 45. At 40,000, 21's in, now 45, 45, 5, 5, bit of 45. At 45,000, all done, 45. I sold out $40,000, buyer number 21. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Hey, John. That's, Where'd it go? Okay. That's John, okay. right? Appreciate it. All right, item number 118. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's in your get catalog. Sometime. Beautiful. Our next Carter Center thing. Absolutely. What's that, Rob and Sue? I say, do you play? Oh, does oh. he play guitar? Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking to me. Hell right. no, I don't Let's play guitar. Let's get together next time we go to the Carter Center. <laughs> Let's play a little bit. That'd be, be fun. That'd be great. That'd be great. I want you to know that I used to play with a little guy named Steve uh, Mil Miller. Yeah. I'm aware Is that of that. Right? A little yeah. freckle faced kid named uh, Billy uh, Skaggs. Yeah, that was his name. Yeah, right. I think he wrote a couple of songs about you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ooh, item 118 in the catalog. Your hand-turned hand Moulthrop bowl, a, a beautiful spalted red maple wood bowl, uh, not only made but donated by Mr. Philip Moulthrop. Gorgeous piece of wood sculpture here. Number 118 in your catalog. About 10,000 where? At 10,000, at five then. $5,000 on the wood bowl. At 5,000, yep, thank you. Yep. Now 10, better 10, then 15. At 15, 15, 15, now 20. 25's in, need 20. At 20,000, at 20,000, dollar 15, now 20,000. At 20, yeah, Tony. At 20,000, at 20, 20, 20, better 20. At 20, Rob's in at 15, and now 20, better 20,000. At 20,000, take 17, five one time. At 17, five, 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 better 17, five, better 17, five, all done at 17, five. At, you say 17.5, Larry. At 17.5. At 17. Larry, do you want to bid 17.5? At 17.5, five, 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 bid at 17.5. <laughs> all done at 17.5. I sold out 15,000. Robin Sue, buyer 25. Thank you. 
All right, we have one item left. You have one chance to go home with a wait, live wait, wait, option for wait, 2021. Mayor, Mayor. Yes, sir. Hey, please, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to just interrupt for a moment. Yes. I love that hat. Would you be willing to sell it? <laughs> you know, I've been known to do that before. <laughs> no, no, Day. Oh, come on, put it up. Let's do it. <laughs> well, we know how that worked, right? Yes, I love that hat. Would you be willing to sell it? <laughs> Is that two people? Well, you need two people for an auction. I guess I would. Come on, put it up. Let's do it. All right. Well, you know what? We'll have to make sure the clerks can do that. This is live. We want to make sure there's a clerk. So we're going to have to say cowboy hat, and it is recorded, so they should be able to figure it out, right? All right. All right. Well, let's do it. All right. You know what? We'll have to make sure the clerks can do that. This is live. We want to make sure that. How about 50000 to start it? We appraised it a couple years ago. I thank you, 50,000, and now 75 on the cowboy hat, number two, and now 75. At 50 and 75,000, at 50, not a 75,000, not a 75, I bet it's 75. I thought we had two people for the auction. At 75, 75,000, thank you, now 100, Rob. At 100,000, not a 111, bet 100,000, you out, Rob. At 100,000, thank you, now 125. At 125, John, at 125, bet the 125, Rob's in 100, now 125. At 100, 25,000 dollars to the 125 five all done yeah. 125 wow 150 yeah. at 150 <laughs> at 150 man you must really like cowboy hats at 150,000 yeah. at 150 so now cool. 175 at 175 five five bid to 175 five bid 175 at 170 all done John at 175 175 150 now 175 anybody else at 175,000 hey, at 175,000 <laughs> what's that Rob I said he's got the guitar. Might as well have the hat. Yeah. <laughs> it could be the next Neil Young. At 175, all done 175. Sold at 150,000, Robin Sue. Thank you again. May I rent the hat to sell the last item? Absolutely. You may. All right. It's all, all good. <laughs> 150,000 to if Robin Sue. Carter thank you again. And thanks it, for I'll that double other bid. bid. <laughs> What's that? What was that, Rob? If you can get Jimmy Carter to sign it, I'll double it. President Carter. If President Carter will sign it, he'll double the bid. So that's on videotape, too. I'll leave it here, and we'll make sure to get it there, and hopefully he will. Excellent. I, I would imagine he would. Thank you so much, Rob and Sue, and thanks for the bids. <laughs> and now we have a painting to sell of his. It's item number 119, your original painting by President Carter. Donated, of course, by President Carter. And as always, you're bidding on one. High bidder gets their choice of the great egret, the wood duck, and the mountain still live. So we'll start it where everybody can jump in. How about $100,000? At $100,000, get it started. At $100,000, thank yep, you. Now yep. 150 at 200 And now 250 Joanne's in yep. at 250 and 253 At $300,000, at $300,000, at 300 And now 350 and 400000 400 You out, John, you're out, Joanne. At 400000 yep. at 400 at 450 At 450 450 now 500 At 500000 at 55 bid of five. Now 550, and you're out, Joanne, at 550,000. At 550,000, dollar to divide 55, 5500, 50, at 550, thank you. And Jim's in, now 600. Everybody else is out, Jim's in, 550, now 600. At 600,000, at 600, yeah. thank you, now 650, Jim. At 650, bit of 600, at 50,000, 600, at 650. And Joanne's in at 600, I need 650, thank you. And now 700, at 700,000, dollar to Jim's in. 700 at 700,000 dollar Joanne at 700,000 and John 700,000 anybody else Jim's in oh, I need 700,000 let's get it to a million for the first zoom live auction or whatever we're doing here yep. at 700 right, now 750 Joanne, go, and now 800 right. at 800 and now 850 <laughs> at 850,000 850 Joanne's in 800 now 850 let's get it there you're not that far away at 850 at 850,000 850,000 it's only money at 850,000 dollar to the 800 now 850 I thank yep. you 900 Joanne at 900,000 900,000 dollar to the 900,000 at 900,000 dollar you're out, Joanne. 859. Yeah. And now 
around 950, Jim and Janet. At 950,000, 950,000, 950. At 950,000, at 950. Hurry now at 950. I need oh, 900. So close. You're out, Jim and Janet. Everybody else is out. Joanne's in at 900. Yeah. I need 950. Uh, I'll bid a million. And nine, Jim builds, bids a million dollars. Jim and Janet. Can you get a letter of habit, yes. guys? I've got a million dollar bid from Jim and Janet, and now a million Whoa. fifty. At a million fifty thousand. At a million fifty thousand dollars. At a million fifty. At a million fifty thousand. All done at a million fifty thousand. A million now. One million fifty thousand. Sold one million dollars, Jim and Janet. Thank you. And what is your number, Jim and Janet? Wow. What what is your number? You know, we, we we love them all. I'll, I guess we'll go for the duck, but they're all great. He they takes the wood duck. Thank 37. you, Jim. And your number 37, is that correct, Jim? Yes. Thank you very much. And, well done. Okay. It's over? It's not so quite. short. It's not quite over because Robin Sue, Jason Carter called his grandfather, President Carter, and he will sign the hat. Yo! All yeah, right. thank you. Good job, guys. Hey, will you all pat yourselves on the back since we're not here to do it? Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, this, is, as I say, is a very new thing. I'd like to thank everybody that did all the tech work. It wasn't easy. We appreciate you being here. It's great to see your smiling faces. And I want to keep reminding everybody that's bidding online to keep bidding right up to the last minute. And uh, set a record there, too, because we all know that the Carter Center continues to build hope, fight disease, and wage peace. And uh, we can't thank you enough. Stay safe and keep making a difference in this world. We thank you all. And, Rob, thank here's you, to you and your hat. Yeah, thank you. Thank all you bidders, every bid counts. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it so very much. Great seeing you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, man. See you next time. Hello, I am Sofia Viatoro from Guatemala. I am working with Rule of Law program. I help to improve uh, access to information for women. When women have access to critical information, women can transform their lives. Thank you, Carter Center, donors, and friends for supporting our work in my country. Well, folks, that does it for another virtual Carter Center weekend. The online auction continues for two more hours at cartercenter.org backslash auction. So you still have time to bid on the items you've had your eye on, but not much time. And you can still text CCW 2021 to 243725. Here's hoping next year we can finally get together in person again. But for now, we're all getting together in this fantastic image made up of the photos you submitted through our virtual photo booth. This is so appropriate because the Carter Center really is made up of all the people who work here and all the people who support us and make this work possible. Thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us this weekend. And thank you for believing in our mission of waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. Good night.